Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together. You want to prepare your heart that today, as you come to the Bible study, you come with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You come with all your intelligence, all your decision making faculty. That whatever the Lord is saying today, you are going to listen to His word. Open your mouth and pray and talk to the Lord. Like God Himself, in His wisdom, in His love, by His Spirit. Will reveal his might unto you. And as he reveals himself in his word, that you, as a real child of God, true child of God, you will be obedient to that word. That your mind, your heart, your spirit, your soul will concentrate. On everything the Lord is revealing to some people. That the word of the Lord will be precious in your sight. You honor the word as you honor the Lord. Give glory to the Lord for condescending to speak. To us, his children, pray that you'll be wide awake as we listen to the word. Receiving everything he has to say unto you. That God will help you to have a fresh understanding as well as a fresh commitment to the word he reveals. So that your life will have a new touch a new direction, a new focus in this new year. And all that the Lord had intended for this new year, the new relationship with Him, a new lifestyle, new direction, that the Lord will fulfill that in your very life. Pray for more of the grace of God. Yieldedness to his word, obedience to his word. Total submission to thus says the Lord. Total commitment to the word, the will, the way of the Lord. So that your life in every area will be pleasing unto the Lord. Demonstrating the mark, the evidence of real salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to the Bible study tonight. 
We know that whatever you do, you do for a purpose. And you brought us here for a purpose. And we pray that that purpose of coming to the Bible study tonight, everything within us will come into agreement and focus so that that purpose, intention, and cause will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you'll open the pages of the scriptures to us beyond what man can comprehend or what man can say. Lord, we pray that you yourself, by your spirit, will teach us from the scriptures in Jesus' name. And our lives, our families, and the whole church will never be the same again because of what you teach us. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to every word coming out of the mouth of the Lord. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Today we're beginning a new series of studies. And we're starting from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 1. Just as a background, the Lord used Paul the Apostle with some fellow laborers to plant the church in Thessalonica. The name of the city is Thessalonica. And the church is referred to as the church of the Thessalonians. As you look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17, you will see how the Lord directed that Paul the Apostle, together with his team of workers and preachers and co-laborers, will preach the word in Thessalonica. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. That's where it all began. There was a synagogue there. A synagogue was a place where the Jewish people were meeting together. Those Jewish people, whenever they met together, they read a part of the Old Testament. And if there is anybody to interpret and explain and apply the word of God, they read in the Old Testament, then they'll call him up and he will explain to them what they had read. But even though they had done that for many years, they didn't understand the voice of the prophets that they read. But eventually we have Paul, the apostle, and his team. And he came to Thessalonica. And we're told that he came to, the to that synagogue. Look at verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. That he is unto them in that synagogue. Unto them where those Jewish people were meeting together. When he went in unto them and three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He was preaching the word unto them. He was bringing the gospel unto them. There are many people that do not understand that there is the gospel in the Old Testament. The mercy of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of sin, the redemption of the soul, the salvation that Jesus Christ eventually brought, and the prediction and prophecy about Jesus Christ being born, and Jesus living a holy life, a righteous life, a sinless life, a spotless life, and becoming the final sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, taking away all our sins, becoming the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Almighty God manifesting his love in the sending of the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior, to be our sin bearer, to be our substitute, to be the final sacrifice. All that is the gospel. And he got that from the Old Testament scriptures that they were reading. And we're told that three Sabbath days he went in unto them, opening and alleging, look at verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. And so he told them that Jesus Christ brought salvation. And many of them accepted. Many of them believed. They turned away from their sins and they became new creatures in Christ. Their lives were turned around. And their families were turned around. And the things they used to do, they were doing them no more. Because salvation had come unto them. Look at verse 4. And some of them 
believed and consorted, that is, they agreed and came together with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. And so you see, the preaching of the gospel in that place actually bore fruit. The preaching of the gospel brought a great result. The preaching of the gospel brought a great harvest into the kingdom of God. And we're told they went from there when persecution arose and they had to go out of that place. The persecution did not stop the preaching of the gospel. It only took those gospel preachers to all the places, we're told, in verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. That is, when they left Thessalonica, they went to another place called Berea. And we're told they continued preaching the word of God there again, who come in thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. That's how to receive the word of God. Those people in Thessalonica, they had received the word of the Lord. And the people of Berea, they even went beyond them. And they had the word of God given unto them. And it says that they received that word of God with all readiness of mind. And it says they searched the scriptures every Sabbath day. Tell me out loud. Daily, every time. These were people that were really converted. They were people that really gave their lives to the Lord. And they were searching the scriptures daily to see that those things were so. And were told in verse 12, many therefore of them believed also. Also of the honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. Their work actually bore a great result. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. Paul the apostle now will remind the people that when the gospel came to them, it came with power, it came with authority, it came with conviction. They were convicted of their sins, and just as I read to you in, in Acts of the Apostle chapter 17, they were converted. They were born again. A great and mighty change came upon their lives. Look at verse 5. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in watch only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much affliction, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And then it says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Ghost. When they received the word of God, they were converted. A great change, a mighty change came upon them. A great transformation in their character, in their conduct, in their lifestyle. A great transformation came upon them. That's why the church was planted there. That's how the church was planted there. As the church was planted there, there were not just people coming to hear the word of God, and that was all. The word of God made a great impact. Look at verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. They became followers of the Lord and followers of the apostles, of the people that are preached unto them. They saw the character, the conduct, the lifestyle, the love, and the fellowship, and the interaction. Everything that those preachers did, and because they had the same grace too, they continued with them. It says in verse 7, so that ye were examples to all that, that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, because from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. And so you'll find that these people, as they accepted the word of God, received the word of God, it had a great impact in their lives. And this is the reason why we're studying the epistle to the Thessalonians, that as that church was, our church will be like that. As you look at First and Second Thessalonians, you'll find that there was no rebuke at all. And there was nothing for Paul the Apostle to say, we regret that we came to you. We're sorry we came to you. We wasted our time that we came to you. We wasted a lot of our talent and treasures speaking unto you because there's no change. There was a mighty change in them. And Paul, the apostle, was so happy and he was so glad because they came unto them. After they left them, he sent Timothy to go and find out, find out what was happening among those people. 
We always like to do that. After you have preached the gospel in a particular place for some time, and you are out of the place, you want to find out how are they doing? How they have, how they have accepted the word of God? How have they believed the word of God? And they're going on in the word of God. And when you find out, if you find out that the people remain new creatures in Christ, new life, transformation has taken place, and they're maintaining that transformed life, it brings joy in your heart that you have not labored in vain. So you look at First Thessalonians chapter, chapter 3, First Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 5. It says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He wanted to check up because persecution arose, trials arose, temptations arose. And because of those tr troubles and trials and temptations, he wanted to find out what they still standing or they had the back leading, or they had falling. And then he says, But now when Timotheus came in verse 6, from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us, always desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. He said, the joy of ministry is that you are standing in the Lord. And when Timothy brought the information back to us that you are still standing and you are remembering us, and you are remembering everything that we taught you, and you are still abiding in the word and living by the word. What a great joy it brought in our heart. And now he was making up his mind, he was going to see them again, and he was going to touch their lives again so that he'll be able to supply whatever was missing in their Christian lives. Let us look at it now from verse 10. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face. He wanted to go back and see them. Go back and teach them more and go back and encourage them or go back and strengthen them more that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And so this church was a church that brought encouragement. A church that made the ministry of Paul the Apostle worthwhile. In fact, it says in chapter 1 verse 3, chapter 1 verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the sight of God our Father. It says every time we remember you, we remember three things about you, your work of faith, we remember that. We remember also your labor of love and we remember your patience of hope. What a church that was. That Paul the Apostle did not have to correct anything, rebuke anything and say, why is this and why is that? Because they were living according to the teaching of the word of God. And when you come to Second Thessalonians chapter 1, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, it brought greater joy to him as he wrote to them again. Chapter 1 verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because that your faith grows exceedingly. By the time I was writing to them the second time, in this second epistle to the Thessalonians, he said, it is something we have noticed. I spoke about your faith and your love and your hope in chapter 1 of the first epistle. But in this now I see that your faith is growing exceedingly. And the love and the charity of every one of you toward each other abounded. What a church that was. It was now telling them as you look at chapter 3 verse 1. Chapter 3 verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. That the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you. He made them the standard. He made them the pattern. He made them the model. He said, we're going to other places. We're preaching the gospel in other places. Thessalonian believers pay for us. All the prayer we need is that all the other places we go, they will be exactly like you. That the word of God will have free cause. They receive the word. They'll accept the word. They'll believe the word. They'll apply the word to their lives. And the word will change their lives 
just as it has had free cause and it is changing your own life. I pray that this church will be like that in Jesus' name. Today we're looking at chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the verse we're looking at today. Since this is an introduction to the epistle, we need to understand how the church actually was and what made the church what it was. We're talking about fruitful labors of purposeful partners, fruitful labors of purposeful partners. You'll find here that there were three in the team. We're looking at that verse one, the first part of verse one, Paul, that's the leader of the team, and Silvanus, the Silas, and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians. They planted the church together. They preached the gospel together. They went there together at the beginning. And now in writing to them, to encourage them, to strengthen them, to build them up, and to give them some challenges and charges, he now brings the other two together, Silas and Timothy with him, writing unto them. And therefore, he's writing as a team. And we're going to look at how a team works. That is, a team of preachers, a team of laborers, a team of evangelists, a team of ministers, a team of the people of God, of Christian workers, as they team up together and they're working together. We want to see how Paul, Silas, and Timothy, how they did it, so that we will know how we too can do it and we're going to do it successfully in Jesus' name. Paul, Silas, and Timothy had a remarkable success on the gentle mission field. In spite of all that they went through, all that they saw, in spite of everything, they still were able to raise up a church of genuine steadfast converts. And these were people that encouraged their hearts. And Paul the Apostle said, I'm encouraged by what I've seen. And then he was encouraging them to move on and to grow in the things of the Lord. The team preached the gospel with power and they raised up Christian churches of steadfast converts. As we look at the character of these, of this particular team, it teaches us a lot as to how we ought to cooperate together and work together in working for the Lord. That word team, if you have anything to write there, write the word team, T-E-A-M. That means together, everybody accomplishes more. Together, everybody accomplishes more. You see, when you are isolated, not listening to anybody, not going along with anybody, and not uh, cooperating with anybody, I'll do it all alone. I'll walk out all alone. I'm going to labor all alone. What I'm doing is the most important and the most significant and it's indispensable. I don't need any other person. You're not going to accomplish much. But when there's a team, in a team you have together, everybody accomplishes more. And then we're looking at these uh, people that came together. Let's look at that again. In verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Silas and Timotheus. Stop right there. What can we say about Paul? What can we say about Silas? What can we say about Timothy, number 1? We know that they were converted. They were converted because we know how Paul, the apostle, was born again. I was converted. How the Lord called him on the way to Damascus and we know that Timothy too was converted, was recommended by the brethren, and Silas Silvanus was converted because he was recommended by the church. That's how they put the team together. Not only that they were converted, number two, they were consecrated. What will a converted person do if he's not consecrated, if he's not committed, if he doesn't surrender, if he doesn't submit his life? His talent, his will, everything that he has. If he has ego that is rising up and he says, I want to do my own thing. I will do my own will. I'm not going to listen to anybody, neither Paul nor Timothy, anybody. I just want to go my own way. You cannot do much even if you are converted without being consecrated. And these three men, as we see the team converted, number two, consecrated, number three, they were crucified. Paul the Apostle said, I am crucified with Christ. The ego in me, the natural self in me, the one that is rising up and competing with everybody else, all that is crucified. 
all that is crushed, all that is destroyed. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what helps them. That's what helped them. If we're working together as a team, no matter the talent of Paul, and no matter the commitment of Silas, and no matter the submission of Timothy, if there is no conversion, if there is no consecration, if there's no crucifixion, will be kind of opposing one another. I'm pulling up, you're pulling down. You're pulling up, I'm pulling down. You're dragging to the right, I'm dragging to the left. There's competition. And then there's contradiction of one another. It is the conversion, the consecration, the crucifixion that brings them together. Not only that, number four, they were called. They were called. Except you are called to do something. But the Lord himself... You will not have the talent or the gift or the grace or the unction or the authority to get it done. There are many people that are jumping around. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. It's the ambition of an Absalom. And it's the ambition of the people that built the tower of Babel. Let us gather together. That was unity too. But we're not called to do that. Let's gather together. We're going to build a tower that reaches up to heaven. Except you are called. And you're told this is what to do. Here is the way. Walk here therein. You'll not be able to do anything significant that will have any reward in eternity. But to be converted and then to be to be consecrated, to be crucified, and then to be called and commissioned. Commission. The Lord said, I will show him what great things he will suffer for my sake. That's what he said of Paul the Apostle. And that's what the Lord said about these people that were called together. They were commissioned. And you know, we want to ask the people who are, you know, here and there, have you been commissioned by the Lord? There are some people, they just ran. God was telling Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah. Go tell those prophets. I never sent them, yet they ran. Because of that, they're not going to profit these people at all. The Lord is saying that if you say just joining the team, that's, that's not the matter. I, I want to be part of the team. Are you called? Are you commissioned? It's not just what I like to do, what I want to do, what I desire to do. I have a great dream, a great ambition. I want to get this. No commissioned. The Lord said, Isaiah, go tell the people. The Lord said, Jeremiah, before you were born, before you were conceived in the womb, I knew you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. He told Ezekiel, he said, son of man, I've made you a watchman over the house of Israel. Therefore, go tell them what I say. Those people were commissioned. John the Baptist was the man sent from God commissioned and it is that that made them to do what they did and will be able to do our own to in jesus name they were conquered their wheels were conquered and you'll find and that's why there's no contradiction no opposition no fighting no conflict and no but no battling one another you know there are people they say they are working together too much argument and too much opposition and too much conflict it's like you know we never see eye to eye we never look in the same direction and we're never having the same mind and the same purpose it's like we're in the same building but our minds are different our ways are different our Thoughts are different. But in these, these people, the wheels were conquered. Not my will, not as I will, but as thou wilt. If you find people together, whether 3 or 30 or 300, if they're not really together, they may be in the same room, in the same church, in the same section, in the same ministry, in the same team. If they're not conquered, if the wheels are not conquered, you won't do much. Just be doing, having him fighting. You'll spend all your strength fighting one another than fighting the devil, the enemy out there and doing what the Lord has called you to do. Number seven, our cross bearing. They bore their cross. They carried their cross. And they didn't shun the cross. They didn't abandon the cross. But they carried their cross. Jesus said, he looked at the people that followed him and he said, except... You deny yourself and carry your cross and follow me. You cannot be my disciple. Cross bearing. What we learn of these people here, number one, they were converted. Are you born again? Are you just coming to church? Are you converted? Are you transformed? Are you changed? 
Are you a new creature in Christ? They were converted. Number two, they were consecrated. Have you laid everything on the altar like these people did? That's how to form a team, a team of people that will effectively preach the gospel, a team of people that the power of God will go through them and then accomplish very much. Are you crucified? Crucified with Christ and yet you live a life that is not yours, a life that is just the life of Christ alone. Have you been called? There was a man saint from God whose name was John. Would you say you are saint from God? Are you sure you are saint from God? Are you saying to do something for the glory of God or just for yourself? Are you commissioned? As he said, I've ordained you that this should go a bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Have you been conquered and are you bearing the cross? These people were a team and the Lord called them and they answered the call, they obeyed the call and they did what the Lord told them to do. The Lord has called us in this church. I said he has called us in this church and we're not here to do any other thing but just to do what the Lord has called and commissioned us to do. And we're going to do it effectively in Jesus' name. Amos chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 3. Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Pick up that word walk. That is moving together, going together, making progress together, going farther together. And then look at another word, their work, laboring together. Can two labor together except they be agreed? Can two pull together except we be agreed? Can two push together except we be agreed? Can two accomplish anything together except we be agreed? What can we do together? Just, you're just coming to church, just coming to Bible study. It's not enough. You're just saying, I'm here. I'm also part of the workers, part of the laborers, and part of the evangelists, and part of the team. That's not, that's not enough. There must be an agreement in the heart. My vision must be your vision. My dream must be your dream. And his dream must be our dream together. It is when we have that same focus and that same dream and that same vision and that same passion. Passion for souls. That we know that those people are perishing. And then we're in agreement together. And we're going to reach them together. It is that dreaming together, loving together, being passionate together, and reaching out to the people together. That is what will bring the result. And we're going to have the result in Jesus' name. Can two walk together except they be agreed? We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. We've noticed the names of those three people in the team. We have Paul, we have Silas, that's called Silvanus there, and then we have Timothy called uh, Timotheus there. Acts of the Apostles chapter 15 verse 14. Let's see how uh, Silas, Silvanus came in. We're told in Acts chapter 15 verse 40, and Paul chose Silas and departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. The brethren knew him. He wasn't a private Christian, a secret Christian, a secret disciple. He had been in and out with the people of God. They knew him to be a real child of God. They knew him to be really born again. They knew him to have the life of a child of God and the life of a minister of the gospel. And when Barnabas went the other direction, the church said, Paul the apostle, you know what? There's another person here that will feed into the ministry very well and therefore he chose silence because the church recommended him as part of the team. We're told in verse 41 and he went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. And now we're told in chapter 16 from verse 1 how Timothy now came in. Well, we're seeing how Silas came in. Now we're looking at how Timothy came in to be part of that team. I'm looking at chapter 16 verse 1. Then came he to David and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, whose name, named, what's the name? Timothy, a certain disciple, disciple, not a sinner, not a backslider, a certain disciple that people knew to be a disciple, walking according to the will of the, according to the way of the Lord, according to the word of the Lord, and they were told his name, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and 
believed. That's, that's, that's what we were told about. He believed. He was a believer. He was a disciple. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Well reported. Having good report, honest report among the people as a real, real child of God. And that's how we have the team. That's why I told you that that team was a team of converted people, a team of consecrated people, a team of crucified people, a team of called and commissioned people, a team of conquered people, a team of cross-bearing people. And so we have seen the testimony of scripture concerning them, that they really knew the Lord. I pray that we too will have the evidence that we know the Lord in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 19. Second Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 19. It says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us. Here now, the, uh, Paul the Apostle was talking to the Corinthians, and he said, We we'll preach the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Jesus Christ as a final sacrifice. Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. Jesus Christ as the one that comes to change and to transform our lives. Jesus Christ as one that comes to give us eternal life. Endless life. Everlasting life. That comes to give us that extraordinary spiritual supernatural life. We we'll preach to him unto you, not just me. Even by me and who? And who? And who else? You see the team there again. It's, it wasn't to lead Thessalonica. They were also at Corinth together. And Paul, the apostle, was reminding the Corinthians that, well, we came to you, both myself and Silvanus and Timotheus, well, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea, was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. And then in Philippians chapter 2, we have an insight into the life of this Timothy. An insight into the faithfulness and the loyalty and the commitment and the trustworthiness of the life of Timothy. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Do all things without what? murmurings and disputings if we're going to be united if we're going to remain like a team together everybody accomplishes more if that togetherness is going to be scriptural and if that togetherness is going to be born of the spirit and maintained by the spirit here is what he's saying that everything we do for the glory of god everything we do for the propagation of the gospel there's no grudging there is no there's no disputing and there's no murmuring then it says in verse 15 that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye do what? Shine as lights in the world. That means then you are going to be part of the team, your life is going to shine. Not that some people are shining and then there's darkness coming out of your own life that is reducing the brightness of the lights of the other people. In verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Look at this now, verse 19. Very important. It's not going to talk about Timothy. It's been talking about no disputing, no murmuring, no argument, no perverseness, no corruption, but straightforwardness and living a life that is challenging to all the people. It's not going to give us an example. An example that illustrates what he's been talking about as to what a Christian life should be, as to what a Christian partner working together, living together, laboring together, what the life ought to be. And it's going to bring Timothy as an example, as a model, as a pattern of for the rest of us, if we're going to be a part of a real working team in the body of Christ. Verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send, what's the name? Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of 
good comfort when I know your state. Have you noticed that he's talking to the Philippians here? And he said, I'm going to send Timothy to you. And when he was talking to Thessalonians, he said, I sent Timothy to you. Look at this, Timothy. Anywhere Paul, the apostle, sent him, he was willing to go and ready to go. And Timothy will not say, hey, Paul, I'm part of the team now. The team should be together every time. How oh, is it you are sending me away? Have I done something wrong? He just went anywhere he was sent. And that is the attitude of a person who is truly converted, a person who is really consecrated, a person who is really crucified, a person who is really called and commissioned, a person whose will has been conquered, a person who is bearing the cross. That's the attitude that no matter where, no matter when, no matter how, there's no grudging, there's no mourning, there's no disputing, there's no argument. He goes where he is sent. I pray God will give us that grace. I said he will give us that grace. That will be a church, a church without murmuring. A church without disputing. A church without argument. A church without conflict. A church without controversy. That's the kind of people Timothy was. That's why they had such a wonderful team. That's why they had such a successful team. And the fruitful work that they did. He said, I'm going to send Timothy unto you when I know your state. In verse 24, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He said, the way Timothy does it is like it's natural to him. Like it's natural for us to drink water. Like it's natural for us to breathe in and breathe out. Like it's natural for us to stand up and walk. It's just so natural to Timothy that obedience was natural to him. Love was natural to him. And caring for you was just natural for him. And that's what the Lord wants us to be. We'll be like that in Jesus' name. When, uh, you know, you're not saying, oh, am I going to do that again? Am I going to go to that place again? And then you're grudging and murmuring and complaining and say, well, they're sending me out again to this and that place. It becomes natural when the grace of God is overflowing in your life. And then he tells us in verse 22, in, sorry, in verse 22, but ye know the proof of him that as a son of the father, he has served with me in the gospel. I pray that that same spirit will be upon you. Will be upon all of us together. I'm coming back now to Second First Thessalonians and chapter 1 verse 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians. I want to show you something that the three of them all through this epistle they were together. And you find Paul, the apostle, we, 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 every time. Look at chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel, our, that's all of them together, the three of them together, came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much affliction, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. The same lifestyle. The manner of men we were among you for your sakes. Timothy did not say, well, that's Paul the Apostle. He can have self-denial. That's uh, Paul the Apostle. He can have such, uh, you know, kind of consecration commitment. But me, I'm not, I'm not like him. They were together. The same mind. The same mouth. The same vision. The same consecration. The same commitment. The same character. The same lifestyle and the same dedication unto the Lord. You know the manner of men. We were among you for your sakes. Look at chapter 2 verse 4. Chapter 2 verse 4. But as we, again, all of them together, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Every time they were together, it's not like he is speaking. Well, that's his own doctrine. That's his own idea. That's his own ideology. That's his own philosophy. Me, I don't believe that. They were together in what they said. They were together in what they did. They were together in how they acted. They were together in everything that they performed. It says, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, their communication was the same. No flattery. 
They were not looking for the praise of men. They just wanted to serve the Lord. And that's why Paul, the apostle, had so much confidence in uh, you know, both Silas and Timothy. And he said, we were not seeking the praise of any man or seeking flattery or whatever it is. We just gave ourselves fully to the Lord. He said, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory. We're not going around saying, uh, honor us, exalt us, lift us up, glorify us, nor of men such we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle. Do you see that? Do you see the we, all of them, the three of them, every time, the same lifestyle, the same commitment, and the same dedication, and the same character and conduct. We were gentle among you as a nurse, even as a not cherish yet, our children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of God, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. Can you see how he used the we and we and we many times? And he said, talk about consecration, we're together. Talk about commitment, we're together. Talk about surrender, we're together. And talk about self-sacrifice, we're together. And talk about faithfully following after the will and the word of the Lord, we're together. And talk about a kind of life that forgets itself. And it's only thinking about the good of the people, we're all together. Look at verse 10. And ye are witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably, what's the next word? We we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And so you'll see that they were all together in their conviction. They were together in their conduct. They were together in their lifestyle. They were together in their consecration, commitment, and yieldedness to the Lord. Look at chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face. It said, we're being together. We're still together. And in the future, we're planning to come to you. And we are still coming together. We're not tired of one another. We're not offensive at one another. We're not trying to avoid one another that when I come next time, I'm not going to come with Paul and I'm not going to come with Sylvanus and with Timotheus anymore because I'm fed up of them. Because, you know, we're not in agreement together. We're just tolerating one another. No. In the past, we've been together when the church was planted. And today, we're still together because we're living the same life. We just love the fellowship of one another. And then in the future, we're still coming together also night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now, God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. In verse 12, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another, toward all men, even as, what's the next word? We do towards you. The love we have towards you is not just me, Paul the Apostle, it's all of us together. Look at chapter 4 verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you. We're writing this to you. We're commanding you together. We're admonishing you together. The three of us, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, this is what we're writing to you. And it's all of us together. It says, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as ye have received all of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. They all believe sanctification, the three of them. It's not like, you know, three people are walking together, and this one says, I believe sanctification. The other fellow says, me, all I believe is just service. All I believe is just walking. All I believe is just, you know, doing your, the best you can. I don't believe anybody can be sanctified. No, the three of them walking together. They believe salvation. They believe sanctification. And they believe that the sanctification is not just for the three of them. It is the will of God for all believers and for the believers in Thessalonica. I'm looking at chapter, 12, chapter 5, verse 12. 
chapter 5, verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, you can see that all through the epistle, whether you're in chapter 1 or chapter 2 or chapter 3 or chapter 4 or chapter 5, it's we together, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, all of them together. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. What a message. He said, Thelonians, you know what? Paul, myself, your, your, your apostle, and then Silvanus, and then Timotheus, we are at peace among ourselves. We have shown you the model. We have shown you the pattern. We have shown you the example. Therefore, all of you too, you can have the same grace and the same calling, and you can have the same influence of the Spirit of God, and be at peace among yourselves. We are going to be like that in Jesus' name. As you look at the Bible, you'll find out God brought some people together. Moses and Aaron, how God brought them together. That's the team. And then you have Joshua and Caleb. The Lord brought them together. While the other ten were saying, no, we cannot go. Joshua and Caleb said, let us go up at once. Having the same message for the people and the same attitude towards the people and the same passion to do what the Lord has called them to do. Don't be afraid of the giants. We can do it, Caleb and Joshua. Do you remember Naomi and Ruth together? Naomi saying, Ruth, Ruth, you can go back. He said, why are you discouraging me to go back from you? I will not go back where you live. I will live. Where you dwell, I will dwell. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God. Your people shall be my people. God, do so unto me. If anything, aught but death, but you and I. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those people together, they faced the fire together, the furnace together, Nebuchadnezzar together. They had the same mind. And if God can join people together like like that and they can be together with you we can be together I said we can be together like Elijah and Elisha you remember like Mordecai and Esther you remember how they were together in the salvation of the Jews that dwelt in Shushan they would have been destroyed but then because they had that same mind and that same commitment and Esther said go and fast for me three days I myself and my maidens too will fast if I perish I perish that's what we're saying if I perish, I perish. If you're going to be in unity with us in saving the in saving the souls of the people that are perishing, it's not that you know you're kind of pampering yourself and petting yourself and taking care of yourself and protecting yourself. I don't want to die now. I don't want to lose my life. You're ready for anything. If I perish, I perish. Those are the people that have a united purpose, a united mind, a united goal that this is what we're going to do and we're going to do it to save the people in Jesus' name. And of course, remember Paul and Silas in the prison. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed unto God. And they sang praises unto God. They were willing to bear their cross. Even in the prison, the unity was still there. Under persecution, the, 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 the unity was still there. Silas was not trying to say, you see, Paul, see what you've done now. Here we are in the prison now. Well, can I talk at all? Can I say anything? If you had not done what you did to cast the devil out of that woman, it looks like Paul the Paul, you're too pushful and you're too aggressive. And some sometimes it's good to be quiet, you know, Paul. There was nothing like that. Even though what Paul the Apostle did landed them in the Philippian jail, they were still in agreement together. That's unity. Not somebody accusing the other fellow that, you know, he is too strict, he is too firm, he's too quick in casting out devils, he's too quick in doing that. If we're doing that, we're not going to be in unity. But when somebody has acted by the Spirit of God and by the Word of the Lord, by the Word of God, we agree with that. Even though it brings persecution or it brings whatever it brings, we're going to remain united. we we'll remain united in Jesus' name. I said we're united in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now. Cases and causes of friction in partnership of soul winners. The first point, the first point, you have it on your outline, is cornerstones of consistent, fruitful partnership in soul winning. Now, cases and causes of friction. Are there cases of friction and separation in the New Testament? Oh, yes, there are, unfortunately. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Acts, chapter 15, I'm reading to you from verse 36. Acts, 
chapter 15, verse 36, and some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and, and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Now Paul called on Barnabas and said, let us go again. We've gone before, let's go again. How is it that he called Barnabas? Look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 2. Chapter 13, verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, who and who? Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. That's what the Lord said. Separate unto me. Barnabas and Saul for the work that have appointed unto them. Look at verse 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. There's nothing wrong in that John joining them. But the point is this, the Holy Ghost did not mention John at the beginning of their being sent out. Please note that. Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. Those two people have a special assignment for them. And then they were going. And then on the way, they chose John. That's their choice. That's their choice. They brought him in. Look at verse 13. And when, now when Paul and, and his company lose from Paphos, they came to Pag Paga in Pamphylia. And uh, read the rest. Read it out loud once you go. And John departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. No problem. He wasn't mentioned by the Holy Ghost originally. Barnabas and Saul. Saul and Barnabas. And now as they were going, he couldn't even finish the chapter. He couldn't even reach one third of the chapter. I'm tired. I'm weary. I want to go back home. Only one quarter of the chapter. The chapter goes to verse 52. It stopped in verse 13. And then now he's gone back. As he went back, they continued. Now, after they continued, a lot of people were saved. John was not there. John, John Mark was not there. As they wanted to go and visit the people back again, now come back to chapter 15. In chapter 15, verse 37, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. Barnabas said, I'm going to call John Mark again. And Paul said, why are you going to do that? That's a young man. He cannot bear the heat of the day. He does not understand how to bear the cross. He does not have the denial. He does not have the commitment. He does not have what it takes to be on the missionary journey. It's going to be a weight and a load, a hindrance, a distraction for us. Leave him alone. Barnabas said, no, he must go with us. That's what we read in verse 38. And Paul thought not good to take with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the world. He was not there when these people were converted. When these people were born again, he was not part of the people that built the foundation. Now we want to go and examine what the Lord has done in keeping those people. And Barnabas said, John Mark must go with us. Paul the apostle said, don't say that. Don't say that. It's you and I that the Holy Ghost brought together. Verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus but we'll never hear about him again he lost the call you know there are many people they're too strong on their point John Mark must go my friend leave this John Mark alone he wasn't part of the people that the Lord mentioned in the original team if he goes okay if he doesn't go okay but why were you going to separate from the calling of God upon your life because of John Mark? 
What are you going to have? Friction, contention, controversy, disagreement. What are you going to separate and have all this battle and fighting? Because of somebody the Lord did not mention, when you were called into the ministry, and that's what we find the people that are going together, working together, moving together, laboring together, building together, planting together, evangelizing together, discipling together. All of a sudden, something happens. And then friction comes and they're separated. I pray it will not happen to us. You remember Abraham and Lot? They were going together. God had called Abraham, and he took Lot along. And eventually, the herdsmen, they began to quarrel on this and this and that. And eventually, Abraham said, Lot, you know what? We're brethren. We shouldn't quarrel. We shouldn't fight. And therefore, you choose whatever you want to choose. And then Lot chose the place that was near Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what happened to him? He lost his wife right there. Because she became a pillar of salt. Even the two daughters, if you know the whole story, they were lost, morally lost, spiritually lost, if not eternally lost. Because of that wrong step that Lord took, be very careful. If God had brought you near Abraham and brought you close to Abraham, beware of what you allow to separate you. Do you remember David and Joab? Joab was walking along with David and eventually separation came. You know why? Because Joab had this kind of uh, secret love for Absalom. And eventually, you know the whole story. You know, Jacob and Esau, they were together too. But the selling of the birthright, sell your birthright to me and voluntarily sold the birthright. And when the time came to have the blessing, he lost the blessing. Jealousy came. Envy came. Hatred came. Be very careful that this kind of free friction and this kind of conflict does not continue like we have read about Paul and Barnabas. If we're going to keep the unity and we're not going to be separated and, you know, kind of disorganized and disunited, and what the Lord has called us for, we don't miss it, we don't lose it. What's the Lord telling us? Number one, there must be cooperation, not competition. Cooperation, not competition. Yeah, that's what will keep, keep the team together. Once we begin, begin to compete with that, I want to be better than you are. You want to be better than I am. And I want to shine more than you shine. You want to shine more than I shine. And I want to put you down so I can get up. You want to put me down so you can get up. We're going to be separated. There must be cooperation, not competition. Number two, coordination, not contradiction. Coordination, not contradiction. Coordination is to coordinate everything and unite it together, form it together, build it together, raise it together. So we edify, we both edify the body of Christ. You allow me to do what I need to do. I allow you to do what you need to do. I empower you to do what you need to do. You encourage me to do what I need to do. And it's coordination rather than contradiction. That's what will keep us together. Number three, conviction not contention. Conviction, not contention. When you have the same conviction as I have, that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's all you need. That's all I need. We have the same conviction together. You believe, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You have that conviction. I have that conviction. And we have the same conviction. We are not contending against one another, but we are contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That's what keeps us together number one cooperation and not competition number two is coordination and not contradiction number three is conviction and not contention number four courage not cowardice courage not cowardice and you know why some people run away why some people fall out why some people fall away and they say the way is becoming tall. The mountain is becoming rough. And the situation is becoming heated. I don't think I can bear this. Or they're cowards. And because of that cowardice, because of that fear, that's why they run away. They say the climate is unbearable. And because of that, they're not able to continue. And they say pray from the thing the Lord has given them that they ought to do. But we're going to have courage. I said we're going to have courage. It says, be strong and be of good courage. 
if you allow cowardice, you're going to just eventually fall away. Number five, correction, not corruption. Correction, not corruption. Uh, you know the things that, uh, you know, separate people. If one person is for correction, it must be perfect. That's what Paul the Apostle said. We're going to come to it that we may perfect whatsoever is lacking among you. And if you want perfection like that, there must be correction. That's not right. Can you put that right? That's not in the right place. Can you put it in the right place? That's not the right way up. Can you set that right again? That's the correction. But if the other person says, oh, what all this correction? All this, you know, put this right right, perfect this, improve this, increase the clean up this, and wash that, and put this right. This is too much, leave everything like that. One is for corruption, the other one is for correction. We're not going to work together. It is when you understand that the best, only the best is good for the kingdom of God. Only the best is good for Christ. And you have that same mind, I have that same mind, and we want that correction together. Then we're going to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Number six, consultation and not controversy. Consultation and not controversy. If there's anything we want to do, what's the best way of doing this? What's the best way of going about this? What's the best way of, of you know, doing this, putting this right? Consultation. Not that there's controversy. Every time argument, every time disputing, every time, you know, we have a kind of troubled mind about one another. Why is see like that? Why am I like this? Why don't we always agree? We're not going to be able to move forward if we're like that. There mustn't be any controversy but just consultation. Then number seven, communication and not confrontation. Communication, not confrontation. Confrontation is when you wear an angry look and a forceful personality and then you're moving as if you know you are rushing at an enemy and then you're challenging the person how is this uh, tell me what happened this this that's confrontation cool down cool down let there be communication let's talk together my brother uh, how did this happen like that should that be in that place oh, how did who put this one here in a very cool atmosphere with understanding and with a good comport with respect to the other person that's what brings unity that's what keeps the unity but when there's confrontation and beating this controversy and argument and everything we're not going to be able to stay together we're going to stay together I said we're going to stay together. And that's why the Lord is telling us that if we're going to stay together, then you are going to have the right mind and the right attitude and the right way. And it's only when we do that, we'll be able to do the work he has granted us to do. We'll do it successfully in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at considerable conversions to the faith through the partnership of saintly workers. In First Thessalonians, again, First Thessalonians, I'm reading from chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 1, and then I'll look at verses 7 to 10. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Have you noticed there is writing to the church? The church of the Thessalonians. What kind of church was that? The church of converted people. The church of saved people. The church of separated people. The church of people that actually knew the Lord. A lot had happened in their lives. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. They themselves had believed. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Because they believed, they were saved. Because they believed, they believed, they were forgiven. Because they believed, they had eternal life. And it says that you are not just isolated believers, private believers. You are now an example to all the people that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. In verse 8, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. You know, they received the doctrine, they spread the doctrine. 
They received the doctrine. They revealed the doctrine. And they, they accepted everything and they gave it out. So that as Paul the apostle came to Achaia and Macedonia. Oh, they said, we have heard that. Where did you hear that? The Thessalonian believers, everything you taught them, they came to teach us. They were not like the Dead Sea, just receiving the water and not giving it out. They were flowing out. They received and they gave. They accepted and they admonished other people. They received and they revealed. And that's what the Lord wants for you and for me. That the word of the Lord will sound forth through you. That as you know about being born again and you are born again, you'll tell other people to ye must be born again. As you know about repentance and you have repented, you'll tell the sinners to you too, you must repent. That except ye repent, ye shall likewise, ye shall all likewise perish. And if you have heard about the righteousness of the Lord and the blood of Jesus Christ has washed you and it makes you righteous, then you also pass it to other people out there too, can be righteous. You'll become a child of God, a son of God, and an hearing you an heir of Christ and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ in that same way you are going to give it to other people how did you will receive the Lord Jesus Christ believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to them that received him he gave unto them power to become the sons of God even to them that believed on his name that is everything you've got you give it out everything you've got you give it everything you've got you give it out you hear about sanctification and you are sanctified you tell other believers to you, sanctification is the way of God and you give it to them so that they'll be able to have what, what you do, what you have and I pray that every one of us will be like that in Jesus name give me a good good amen, amen. I'm looking at Luke chapter 10 verse 1, Luke chapter 10 verse 1 he sent them out and he told them to go and give what they have got, if you've got it, give it out if you receive it, go and reveal it if somebody preach to you, go and preach it to all the people too. In Luke chapter 10 verse 1, And after these things, the Lord appointed all the seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face. And they were told into every city and every place whither he himself would come. Look at verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. You see, they went out and they did what he told them to do. And the Lord told them in verse 20, notwithstanding, in days rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because, because of what? Your names are written in heaven. They were born again. They were converted. And then they went to tell other people how they too can be born again. That's what you find in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 37. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 37. Now, when they had this, they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, removal, forgiveness of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call and with many of and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward evil generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day they were added unto them. How many? About 3,000 souls. They received the word and they gave it to other people too. And that's what the Lord wants us to do, that we receive the word and then we give to other people. And many, many people become born again, become saved. Their lives are turned around and their lives are transformed. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the, into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake, not only spoke, they so spake with all their strength, with all their intelligence, with all the strength and ability that they had, they so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Gentiles, believed. That's the purpose of preaching. That's the purpose of studying the word. 
That's the purpose of declaring the gospel unto people that they so speak that Jews and Gentiles in their multitudes, they believed they were born again. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Verse 2, that's what you call persecution. Verse 2, that's what you call difficulty. Verse 2, that's what you call opposition. But you see, there are some people, once they have a little challenge, they're on their way. They say, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to come to that place again. I'm not going to reach out to those people anymore. And that's why many people are not receiving the gospel today. That's why many people are not hearing the gospel today. You try to stand up in the bus to preach. And then they shouted you down. I never do that in my life again. Or you try to go into your community. And then you talk to people about being born again. Coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Having a change of life. Transformation of life. And then they opposed you. They contradicted you. They persecuted you. And they made you suffer. Or they mocked you. Or they did some things that were painful. And then say, I'll never do that again. Look at verse 2 again. It says, The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Look at verse 3. Long time therefore. Because of that opposition, Paul the Apostle said, If there was no opposition, I would have finished and gone. If there was no persecution, I would have rounded up and gone. If there was no contradiction, I would have just, uh, you know, given the summary and the conclusion and then I'm gone. But if because of that contradiction, because of that opposition, because of that persecution, long time therefore abode they speaking timidly, cringing, fearfully. How? Tell me out loud. Tell me like you are bold. Boring. You are bold. Don't let suffering stop you. Don't let persecution or position stop you. Don't let a sinner that doesn't have the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, all he has is his defiled human spirit. Then he opposes you because of his lack of understanding, a child of darkness. And then you claim to have the Holy Spirit. And the one that has only human spirit is more bold, more aggressive in its opposition than you having the Holy Spirit. Paul the Apostle said, no, that will not be right. If all they do all that havoc, all that persecution, all that opposition, all that controversy. If all that is only by the human spirit, we who have the Holy Spirit will show that we have something greater. We have something greater. I said we have something greater. If those people that do not have the Spirit of God run you out of town, what do you have? Look at verse 3. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands because they remained there and will not allow the opposition to drive them out of town. Because of that, many more people came to know the Lord. I pray God will give you that same spirit of the conqueror in Jesus' name. We'll be talking about the United team that went out and they'll preach the word. But I don't want you to go out with the impression that only when you have somebody with you can you do something. That only when you have another Silas, another Timothy, can you go out and do something. If you're alone by yourself, you can still do something. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, I'm reading to you there from verse 7. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thine sin purged. And I heard 
the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, tell me the rest. Here am I, send me. We don't have to wait for Silas and Timothy. If they are there, praise the Lord. If they are not there, praise the Lord. We are moving on. Even if you are alone by yourself, here am I, send me. Jeremiah, I'm reading from chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And I'm reading there from verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee, thee singular, in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, I Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, not unto us, just unto me, say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And, I, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Jeremiah, God called him. He said, don't say I'm a child. I don't say I'm waiting for Paul. I'm waiting for Silas. I'm waiting for Timothy. Go, I have sent you. He has sent you and you will go. Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee singular. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. The Lord has called you. And since the Lord has called you, you are going to go. Amen. You are going to preach. And you're not going to say, I'm waiting for a team. If the team is there, praise the Lord. If there's no team there, go ahead and do what the Lord has told you to do. John chapter 1. Gospel according to St. John chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to be a witness of the light that all men through him might believe. A man sent from God. His name was John. If you have partners, praise the Lord. If there's no partner, go ahead and go and preach the gospel. And the Lord will affirm, confirm the word in your mouth in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 13. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, verse 13. Then Ananias said, answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto me, go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel. That's Paul. He is a chosen vessel. The Lord called him. And when the Lord called him, he sent him out. Silas came later. Praise the Lord. Timothy came later. Praise the Lord. But even if they are not there, go ahead and do what the Lord has called you to do. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16. For I will show him, not them. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. If the Lord has called you, go ahead, do what the Lord has called you to do. You will succeed. Amen. You'll preach the gospel everywhere you go in Jesus' name. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. That's Paul the Apostle. Timothy came later, praise the Lord. Silas came later, praise the Lord. But whether they come or they don't come, the Lord has given you a commission. He has given you a calling. Go ahead and do it. I have laid a foundation and another build it thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, we are who we are. Again, tell me out loud. I am what I am. You see, you're going to face the judgment day all alone by yourself. You're not going to say, Lord, I would have done this, but Silas did not cooperate. I would have done this, but Timothy did not come in time. I would have done this, but there was no team. He called you. And because he has called you, and he has, you are born again all alone by yourself. 
He called you by his grace, all alone by yourself. He has given the great commission unto you, all alone by yourself. Yes, he's giving Silas to you. Silas will answer for himself. He's giving Timothy to you. Timothy will answer for himself. And if you don't do what he has called you to do, you cannot say it's because, it's because of Silas. It's because of Timothy. You will face the judgment seat as an individual alone by yourself. And Paul the apostle said, I am what I am by the grace of God and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored, I labored, not we, I labored more abundantly, more than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Second Timothy chapter 4, Second Timothy chapter 4, when the day of reckoning comes, you will have to give account by yourself yourself alone second timothy chapter 4 i'm reading to you from verse 6 for i am now ready not we not we i am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand i have fought a good fight i have finished my course i have kept the faith henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge shall give us me at that day and not to me only but to all them also that love is appearing you will do what the lord has called you to do when people come and they join praise the lord you do it together if they don't join and you are all alone by yourself rise up and get the work done you will do it in jesus name let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer that God will help us. What has committed into our hands will be done. He's giving us the word. And he wants us to receive that word. Believe that word. And let that word have a great, great impact. In your heart, in your life. Converted. Converted. That's the purpose of the word that we have heard. When the Thessalonians heard the word, they turned them around, changed them, converted them, saved them, and transformed their lives. Open your mouth and tell the Lord. Any change in your life? Any conversion? Any transformation? Are you different today from what you were? Many years ago, converted, consecrated. They laid everything upon the altar and lived for Jesus day after day. Give yourself to the Lord, consecrated unto him, not holding back anything, not keeping back anything. He gave his life for you. And he wants you to give everything you've got. Your life, your breath, your existence. Everything you've got unto him. Laying it on the altar for the salvation of other people. All the people laid down their lives to get you saved, to preach to you, to bring the word of God to you. It's now your time. That you too, you will lay down your life, your talent, your will, no argument, no murmuring, no disputing. Do it for the salvation of souls. See the calling the Lord has given you. Follow through with that calling. Converted, changed, transformed, turned around. New life, new behavior, new character, new conduct. Let that evidence of grace show, appear in your life. Consecrated. If you're like those people who have read about, who have studied about today, you'll be more consecrated today than you were last year, than you were years before. 
every day will see you getting more and more consecrated unto the Lord. Crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Your natural self is crucified. The carnal nature is crucified. The Adamic nature is crucified. The native self crucified. What you used to be crucified. The one that wants to express your own peculiar eccentricity. Crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. The evil nature crucified. Sinful nature crucified. Hardened nature crucified. The rebellious nature crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Ego does not live anymore. The sinful nature does not live anymore. Not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live. At school, in the community, in the church, at home. With my friends in the midst of persecutors and opposers, the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Crucified. Called. Many are called, but few are chosen. Are you called? Have you responded to that call? Have you given yourself to that call? Are you responding immediately when he called Peter, James, John, Andrew? They responded immediately. There was no delay. They gave everything they've got. Lord, I will do your will. Lord, I will follow you. Whithersoever you go. They rose up and they followed him. Following his footsteps. Called commissioned are you struggling with the Lord fighting against the commission are you waiting for John Mark if John Mark is not there then I'm not going to do what I need to do if Demas has forsaken you and Following after the things of this world, then I'm, my hands are paralyzed and weakened. No! Demas or no demons? Barnabas or no Barnabas? John Mark or no John Mark? Arise and put your neck to the yoke. And do what the Lord has called you to do. On the final day, you'll give account of how you responded to the call and the commission conquered. Your will is crushed. Your ego is cancelled. The evil personality is conquered. That now you are submissive and surrendered and yielded in his hand. Conquered. Cross bearing. What's your cross? What's the difficulty? What's the opposition? What's the persecution? the more persecution arose against Paul the Apostle and his team. It says, longer time therefore they abode in that place because of the persecution. And he said, Satan, do your worst. We're going to obey the master. Jews, Gentiles, opposers, Persecutors, do your worst. Long time 
abode they in that same place preaching the word obeying the master fulfilling their calling and commission the Lord has called you give in to that call respond to that call if you are working with a team let there be cooperation let there be coordination If you are working in a team, let there be good communication, consultation. Not controversy, not contradiction. Deny yourself of wanting to have your own way Give up something. Sacrifice something. So you can keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Not always wanting to have your own way. Let there be correction, not corruption. And keep you united, meek, humble, obedient to the word. Let the carnal nature die. And remember the calling of the Lord upon your life. He called Isaiah as an individual. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. If there's no team, go ahead and do the will of God. Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born. Anybody you know now, I called you before you knew them. Anybody on earth, any supporter, any opposer. I called you before they came up. Go where I've sent you. Do what I've told you to do. You know, so I'm waiting for a team. If the team is there, okay. If the team is not there, go ahead and do the will of God. Ezekiel, I've made you a watchman over the house of Israel. Hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Do it, even if you have to do it all alone. John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Rise up and do it. Do it with conviction. Do it with courage. Do it with constancy. Don't look back. Don't give up. Obey the Lord who has called you. We must obey God rather than men. Don't be afraid of men that do not have the spirit of God. If they are bold in their opposition, by just the human spirit, you ought to be bold in your obedience by the energizing and empowering of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and obey the Lord. The fruit will come as a result of obedience. The reward will come as a result of the obedience. And Paul said at the end of the day, I fought a good fight. 
I've finished my course. He did it. You can do it. The Lord is waiting for you. The Lord is depending upon you. Be trustworthy. Be loyal. Be faithful. Go preach the gospel to every creature.